All right, today we're going to talk about one of the most toxic smart contract feature in existence and how to protect yourself from it. I'm talking about the self-destruct operation. If you're new here, I'm Stefan, and on Eat the Blocks, we help Web2 developers get into Web3. Before we jump in, a quick mention regarding the three months Web3 mentoring program. You can enroll right now and start your journey into blockchain with a mentor, amongst other things. You'll learn how to build a portfolio of Web3 projects, how to create your online presence as an expert, and how to access a network of like-minded developers. All right, self-destruct or suicide, as it was called before getting the alias self-destruct in the Ethereum improvement proposal number six is an opcode operation at the EVM level, independent of what language or client you are using, actually. And what that operation does, it destroys the contract's code and sends all of its current balance to any address you specify. So imagine you created a smart contract. It contains a few ethers, but you don't need it anymore. Or maybe there's a bug in it. Self-destructing the contract by calling self-destruct address is quite convenient because it costs far less gas than just sending the balance with addressed send this balance. As a matter of fact, the self-destruct opcode uses negative gas because the operation frees up space on the blockchain by clearing all of the contract's data. And this negative gas deducts from the total gas cost of the transaction. So a pretty cool feature when you want to do some cleanup. With that being said, even if a contract is removed by self-destruct, it is still part of the history of the blockchain, which means it is retained by most Ethereum nodes. So using self-destruct is not the same as deleting data from a hard disk. Now, it's all fine and dandy, but where's the issue here? Well, there are a few actually, but there are two big ones. First, note that if anybody sends some Ether to a destroy contract, that Ether is forever lost. There is no code that they address anymore. So essentially, it's like burning your ETH, just like you do when you send it to address zero. The second is that even if you disallow incoming Ether transfer into your smart contract, meaning you didn't create any payable functions, there's no fallback function, it is still possible to force Ether into your contract. Self-destruct is a powerful operation that can cause huge damage in the wrong hands. So let's have a look how. So just to show you an example, here's how the self-destruct operation works. So we've got a simple contract with a function kill and a function that we're going to call just to see if the contract has been indeed self-destructed. So you can see on line 8 the self-destruct function that is going to send all the remaining ethers on this contract to this payable address. So let's compile it and then let's deploy it. There we go. So if I call my do I exist function, I'm going to receive the string yes, I'm here. But now if I call the kill function, if I try to call the do I exist function again, this time there's nothing. We have successfully deleted all the codes of this contract. You could also use a helper function and that helper function would call the kill function here and then the helper function would receive the either. So that's how the self-destruct functions. Okay, so now that we know how it works, let's look at another example that has a vulnerability. I'm going to use this classic example from the Solidity by Example website. So this is actually a game called Etherscan. And the goal of this game is to be the last one to deposit one Ether. More precisely, you need to be the seventh person to deposit one Ether. But we also have an attacked contract that at some point is going to self-destruct and send all the remaining Ethers to this contract here. And this is going to break the game. So let's see how. So first, let's compile that and let's deploy it. I'm going to get rid of this one. Now I copied the address of the game contract. And I'm going to paste it right here for the constructor of the attack contract. There we go. And I'm just going to add five ether to this contract. My balance here is now five ether. So let's play the game. I'm going to send one ether and call the deposit function. Okay, we can see the balance is now one. 
Now a second player is also going to deposit one ether. There you go. So now we have two ethers in this contract and we have five ethers in this contract. So now what we're going to do, we're going to self-destruct this contract, send all the remaining five ethers in this contract. So the balance will immediately go to seven. Okay. So I attack. So here my balance is now zero in the attack contract. And in the ether game contract, the balance is seven. And if I look at the winner, there's nobody. It's the zero address. So let's try to make one more deposit. And it's reverted. And we can see that the game is over. And so what happened? You can see that on line 27, we check the balance with address this balance. Okay. And at this stage, the balance is actually eight. Seven plus the new one ether that we are trying to send. Then you go to line 28. And in this case, the new balance eight is superior to the target amount seven. So in this case, the game is over. And we never go to line 31 because when we self-destruct the contract attack, it didn't go through this process. It immediately injected the five ethers in this contract without going through the deposit function. So there's no winner. And so that's basically how you break the contract. And so what you can do to prevent this, instead of relying on address this balance to check the actual balance of this contract, what you can do is store the balance in a public uint. So you can see that on line 12, we actually check the value of this balance right here. And as you can see on line 12, we update the value of balance with the message value. And then on line 13, it checks this value against the target. So even if I try to attack this contract with self-destruct, it's not going to work because now when we check the balance, we're not checking the actual balance of the contract. We check the value of this public variable here. So let's do that. Now I'm going to attack the contract. Okay. So we can see that the actual balance of the contract is seven, but the variable balance is still at two. So if somebody else tried to deposit, we can see the actual balance went up to eight. The value balance is now three and the game is not broken. So you can technically still play the game until there's a winner. And it's just this tiny little change here that's protecting the smart contract from the self-destruct. So what can we conclude from this? Let's talk about a few good practices. First, be sure that the address of the contract is removed from your app after self-destruct has been called on the contract. Also, as we just saw, don't rely on address this balance to check the contract balance. Instead, you can set a variable balance, for example, to increase only after the user deposits if into the contract and you do your check with that variable. Another thing you can do is deactivate or disable or pause your contract instead of destroying it by changing some internal state, which causes all functions to revert. That actually makes it impossible to use the contract as it returns the eaters immediately. You can also use the pausable contract from OpenZeppelin, which does exactly that. Some suggest that the self-destruct operation should evolve, so keep an eye on it. Before I end this video, a quick mention again about the three months Web3 mentoring program. With this program, you get a weekly technical call, a weekly non-technical call as well, when you can get advice on your career, social media presence, etc. You also get one weekly one-on-one -on -one call with your mentor. You get access to the private Discord chat, as well as the lifetime access to all video courses and future updates. Register now at eattheblocks.com slash web3 mentoring program. Thank you for watching this video. You can find more videos about hack and security right here. I'll catch you in the next one.